This is the Emergency Medical Minute, sponsored by Health One. The Emergency Medical Minute and CarePoint hosted a panel on a wide variety of topics. This is Dr. Susan Ryan with some orthopedic pro tips. Okay, we're going to try and make it up for Neil. Okay, you're done. Medical Eagly, one of the things to think about is that Ortho does account for a lot of cases, but it does cost the patient a lot if we miss things. So if you just look at this from an orthopedist standpoint, just don't miss these things. When we don't diagnose it, we don't get enough views, we don't appreciate associated injuries that come with it, like the obvious calcaneal fracture, think lumbar, those kinds of things. And then when we don't manage it appropriately from the beginning. This truly is back to the basics. Always, always examine joint above, joint below. Never forget to do it because it makes a difference in a lot of the cases. And always remember to document your neuro exam. People sometimes forget to do that. Oh, it's just a wrist fracture, whatever. Well, if they have a sudden medial compartment syndrome, you need to have documented that from the get-go. And it's really just a matter of knowing your anatomy. If it takes you a minute, look up anatomy on your internet and be able to say the right names of the bones because there's nothing that makes you look worse with an orthopedist than to say, you know the bone that's right above the wrist on the thumb side? And it happens all the time. (laughs) At a minimum, you want to have three views, and everyone always wants to say, get the other views from the opposite side. You actually would be better off to get more views of the same side that's injured. Just rotate it a little bit more and see if you can tease it out. Try adding a stress view if you're worried about a scaphoid or scapholunate injuries, the clenched fist. We'll go through that. When it's a real subtle fracture, remember that 73% of CT findings can pick them up, but MRI's 100%. It's just a matter of time. You know, It's hard to get them sometimes, at least for us at Rose. And if you have to, snap a picture from the um, computer and send it to your rad, or to your ortho. So really fast, don't forget all the components to naming fractures. Name the bone right, the location. We always go proximal, mid, distal. Whether there's angulation, displacement, which is in the long axis, um, whether it's open, closed, obvious, if there's neurovascular compromise, those are some of the names of them, but I don't want to spend a lot of time on that. Apophyseal injuries, they can trip us up a little bit because we maybe don't see a lot of kids in some ERs. Um, Oscar Schlatter's, everyone remembers, is the tibial tuberosity. But the, the mechanics are the same. It's The ligament is stronger than the bony attachment. So you're going to start to see it pull in places where there's a lot of load. So patellar tendon, as we get a growth spurt, pulls on that. So it gets a little torn away, and it looks pretty ratty. Severs disease is the same process on the calcaneus. So if you get an x-ray of it, don't freak out, because most of the time it's it's just Severs disease. It's just really fragmented looking. Don't forget about the kids, even up to 20, because the ischial tuberosity is the latest to close on that. But people running, doing some like kickboxing move, you can get somebody that suddenly gets avulsion of that apophysitis. And it can be really debilitating. It's not going to be an enormous medical legal thing, but it would help if you let them know it's going to be a while before they weight bear. The fifth metatarsal fools a lot of people. Its growth plate is oblique, whereas most are transverse to the long axis. But when you see an oblique, what looks like an avulsion off the proximal fifth where the extensor um, perineal brevis attaches, that's where it pulls That's just a growth plate. But if it's transverse, that's the fracture. Okay, foosh injuries are a big problem with missing things. So we're not going to go at all through distal radius, common radial uh, fractures that you see, even Smith's, the reverse collies. But think about scaphoid. A little trick to tease it out is if you can get to that volar surface and then open it up, you can feel the edge of that scaphoid. So if it's tender there, get the extra view of turning the wrist. Um, If you can actually load the thumb, that makes a difference too in fractures. And remember, that's got the reverse blood supply, so it's going to be more likely to get avascular necrosis for the proximal injuries. Perilunate dislocations are often overlooked. And I don't have an x-ray, but think about Capitate sits in the lunate, sits on the radius. It's a biscotti and a cup of tea on a saucer. 
if that gets disrupted on the lateral, you got a problem. One of the residents that I was teaching sports medicine to at St. Joe's called me once and said, I don't remember what it is, but somebody's mad because the tea spilled. Like, that's all they could remember, but that's important. So a perilunate dislocation, and it goes in this order, perilunate dislocations occur first, and so you'll get the biscotti is not dipping into that cup of the lunate. The next one, more force required to get the lunate dislocations, the cup of tea actually spills, and then then you can really just start to shatter everything. These are going to require conscious sedation to reduce them. Um, Acute compartment syndrome of the median nerve for carpal tunnel happens with some fractures, so don't forget to, to document that. We're not going to do compartment syndrome in general, though. And then the drudge, ooh, yeah, drudge injuries. The key there is that they block your ability to pronate and supinate. So drudge stands for distal radius ulnar joint. So we've seen those. Everybody has seen them. They just didn't appreciate them. It's the foosh that they mostly complain of the ulnar side can be a TFCC, triangular fibrocartilage complex injury, but it can be that you've disrupted the drudge complex. And so obviously not a, a distal radius fracture. Are you going to go like, can you supinate it? I mean, they're broken. This is the person who's like, God, it just bugs me, and it keeps bugging me, and they come in non-acutely. That person, if they can't pronate and supinate, think about it. There's a piano key sign where you take the ulna and you kind of can compress it. Like if it can go down like a piano key, then you've probably torn those ligaments. And then the TFCC. The key, splint in long position in a supinated position. Okay, elbow injuries. It's Everyone always knows to look for the big sail sign, but think about the little subtle ones. And think about if you don't get the x-ray at 90 degrees, you're going to miss the subtle effusions. So at 90, it's just like your folds on your shirt. There's going to be a little fluid. It sits here. So anterior can be fine at 90 degrees. So front fine, back bad. So if you see a posterior effusion at 90 degrees, you've got a fracture. Whether you can find the fracture or not, you've got it. But what if it's a person who can't ex you know, flex you to 90 for the x-ray? Then if you're seeing it more prominently posteriorly, that can be normal. So just be aware of the subtleties. As you're foosh, you're going to transmit forces up. So fractures start to go up, and kids, they get up into the elbow more commonly than adults. Always adults, it's most common, the radial head. But in kids, it's always hard to remember which growth plate closes. So that's the mnemonic, Krytol. You can Google it. You don't have to memorize it. But it stands for the capitellum radial head, internal um, or medial epicondyle, and then the olecranon and a lateral epicondyle. Okay, so on the x-rays, two important views. Sitting like this, anterior humeral line comes down, and it cuts the middle third of the capitellum. Which side's the capitellum? You can put a cap on a head, right? So that's on the radial side, if you're trying to remember which one of those is it. And then that's on a true lateral. And then the radial capitellar line is coming from here, and it will go into the capitellum, and it intersects. And they should both intersect right on the capitellum. So those are the only lines to really watch. In the shoulder, as we move up, don't forget, posterior dislocations look funny. You can get, you know, they won't move the arm, and x-ray says, ah, oh, that's good enough view. It's not good enough. Always get your axillary view. Why isn't good enough? You want to see that it articulates with the glenoid. Um, posterior ones look funny. It's that light bulb sign because instead of it sitting like this, when it goes back, it looks like this. So the view on looks more like a light bulb. So make sure you get your all the views you need. And then in dislocations, always check your axillary, musculocutaneous, and the vascular before and after. It does happen. It happens in commonly, thankfully, but I had one myself. And if I wasn't so good at sports medicine, I would have freaked out. But I had a little old lady that slipped her in easily. It was no effort whatsoever, no medication to do it. And right before my eyes, I watched this hemarthrosis develop. I called ortho. They're like, meet me in interventional radiology. We went there, and she had this axillary artery that had torn. And probably it had torn with a dislocation and was tamponading. And then the second I reduced it, it went poof, right back and was able to drain. OK, least Franck injuries. We hear about them, hear about them, hear about them. Nobody ever sees them. 
I've been doing this 30 years, did a fellowship in sports medicine, I've done a lot of practice in this, and I don't see them very often, and I saw one the other day with a PA. So they are missed a lot of the time in the ER. They're midfoot injuries. It's the metatarsal tarsal joints. People always think it's this big high velocity injury. It was named after a field surgeon for Napoleon. And they're thought of that your foot's in a stirrup, you get shot off. What can happen if your foot's in a wind, uh, you're windsurfing and your foot's in that scrap? Um, it can happen with lower velocity. So we don't usually miss the high velocity because you're thinking about it. The low velocity ones are, I'm laying in a scrum pile in rugby or football and someone steps on my foot. So I'm prone, they step on it and it forces it um, into a, a forced plantar position and externally rotates. The other time you see it, and that's what this guy was, he stepped off of a curb, didn't even think it was that funny, and he couldn't put weight on it. Came into the ER, got a diagnosis of gout, cellulitis, sprain, and then I saw him and we MRI'd him and all of his ligaments were totally torn up, no fracture. So always have that suspicion. If you do see the flex sign, which is a little avulsion at the base of the second metatarsal, um, or you see big bruising on the plantar surface, it's much more suspicious of an injury. Okay, the syndesmotic injuries of the ankle. No one's gonna miss the ankle fractures generally, but the sprains, the high ankle sprains, can be really devastating to people. Um, they take eight to 12 weeks to recover. And so you wanna squeeze and see if that bothers them, palpate up the syndesmosis, try bringing them up into dorsiflexion and externally rotating them and see if that reproduces some of the pain. And then think about those mechanics. If that hurts, spiral it up to the proximal and then you see the Massonew fracture. Knee injuries. The keys here, don't miss the extensor mechanism injuries. So the old man that comes in and says, my knee hurts, you know, having a hard time waiting, walking on it. Make sure that when you lay them down that they can, in fact, extend it because you don't want to miss a patellar tendon that's ruptured or a quadricep tendon that's ruptured. So just make sure that's intact. And total true knee dislocations are neurovascular catastrophes. Sadly, one of our PAs went down with one. Unbelievable. That's it. If you enjoy the Emergency Medical Minute, please help us out by rating us on iTunes. For more free medical education, follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Make a donation and subscribe to our newsletter at emergencymedicalminute.com.